Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to Iconex Talks, uh, the great platform for every Friday with great, amazing um, superstars uh, in science and technology. So my name is Misu Kim, an assistant professor uh, from Sungyeonggwan University. And today I'm going to serve as a moderator for today's all the event. And then this is my first time to serve as a moderator. You may remember me as a speaker or a panelist last year, but this year, this is my first time to be on stage as a moderator. So this is my great honor. So before we move on, I would like to advertise uh, these amazing stars for July. Uh, so they're gonna uh, uh, shine on our uh, every Friday. So today we're gonna have a, uh, one of the superstars, Professor Antonio Facetti from Northwestern University. And then you're gonna see him soon. And up, in the upcoming Fridays, we're gonna have Dr. Sarma and then uh, Anna and Joanna. And at the end of this month, we are gonna have Yuri from the Director University. So please join us every Friday, not this one. And then I hope to see you again. So, and today we are gonna have these amazing people on stage, they are ready to go. And for a speaker, we, we are gonna have Professor Antonio Facetti for a materials or view the title of materials for organic electronics from Northwestern University. And he's a co-founder of Flex, Flex Terra. And we are gonna have two amazing panelists, Professor Meng Di Han, Professor Li Feng Chi, uh, Li Feng Chi. And we're gonna have X Challenger, um, how young, uh, sorry about that. How, um, I'm sorry, I cannot see his name here from, so sorry. Uh, we are gonna have an ex-challenger, uh, Mr. Haoyang Wang. So I'm going to introduce these panelists and our ex-challenger after uh, the uh, Pro Professor Antonio Facetti's talk. So let me introduce Professor Facetti first. So um, let me uh, briefly introduce him here. So he earned uh, his Laura degree in chemistry and the PhD in chemical sciences from the University of Milan in Italy. And then he, he, he got, uh, he carried out postdoctoral research at the University of California, Berkeley with Professor Andrew Strayweiser and at Northwest University with Professor Toby Marks. And in 2002, he joined Northwest University where he is now an adjunct professor of chemistry. And more importantly, he's a co-founder and currently the chief technology officer of Flex, Flex Terra. So I wouldn't uh, mention every his, uh, his paper here because he has authored like over 550 research articles and he got so many awards. And he's, he's, uh, he's been, assigned, he's been uh, no, uh, nominated as a fellow members of so many prestigious academies, academies and everything. And he's gonna share his research uh, experience and amazing wisdoms uh, with the title, Materials for Organic Electronics. So I'm going to stop here and then let me introduce Professor Antonio Facetti. So Facetti, uh, Professor Anton Antonio Facetti, Thank you. the word is Thank here. you so much. Should I share my screen? Yes. <laughs> okay. Let's see, this one, let me put the laser on. Uh, here we go. Okay, good, can you see it? <clears throat> okay, go. thank you again. I want to thank the organizer for the opportunity to give this talk um, and present my work, which is uh, being carried out both at Northwestern University and Flexterra Corporation, as long as with many, many collaborators that I'm going to acknowledge uh, during my talk. Uh, let me start from the outline of my talk. Uh, many people should know where what is Northwestern University, but maybe many, very few of you know about Flexterra Corporation. So I'm going to introduce Flexterra and the motivation from my work. I'm going to try to cover three areas of research. One uh, related to semiconductor for flexible and stretchable transistors. So I'm going to introduce about the TFT structures example of small molecule and polymers used to fabricate these devices. And also I'm going to show you an example of applications to produce a flexible display. Then I'm gonna very briefly to talk about some of the organics used for uh, photovoltaics for bulk heterojunction uh, cells, particularly looking at molecular and polymeric non-fullerene acceptors. And finally, if time permits the last uh, five minutes, just show another example where organic material and particularly the semiconductor can play a key role, which is in the uh, SERS area for sensors. 
So Flexterra Corporation was started in 2016 from technology developed at Polyera and from an investment from the Size Getter Group. We have uh, three facilities. One is in the US in Skokie, where we do chemistry and materials development. One in Italy, where we do formulation and scale up and quality control with the support of the size group. And one in uh, uh, Shinju in Taiwan, where we do uh, process engineering customer support. Uh, our group involves about 40 people. And our mission is to be a material supplier for solution process electronic industry. So what we've been doing both in Northwestern and uh, Flexterra, um, obviously with final different focus for Northwestern more on education and science and Flexterra for more for technology and commercialization is to be develop unconventional materials, processes and understand the science behind their properties and functions for application in several optoelectronic uh, devices. And uh, these devices are uh, in the area of flexible printed electronics, transparent electronics, uh, energy uh, harvesting and, and storage. And uh, the, the transition would be going from devices which are rigid, heavy, flat, uh, produce uh, from vapor phase material at high temperature, which are typically opaque, uh, heavy, rigid, to devices which are more flexible, light, conformable, uh, produce it uh, in, uh, from solution starting material and uh, process at low temperature, optically transparent, and possibly easy to integrate with fabric and plastics. And these are quite uh, very interesting uh, industry in terms of markets, going from about a half a trillion dollars for the semiconductor industry, a few billion dollars for printed electronic and transparent electronics, and uh, several billion dollars for PV and, and batteries. And the materials portion of this industry are also quite interesting. So for a material supplier like Flexterra, capturing a very small amount of, of these markets can be really substantial. If you look at the technology transition and the science as well, going from the, in terms of the electronic materials perspective, you go uh, from material which are mostly inorganic, very high performance, stable, durable, um, typically insoluble, and a process at very high temperature, very hard and rigid, to materials which are mostly organic, uh, typically lower performance, uh, less stable, not too much intrinsically, but mostly about the process that they have to be subjected to create the devices. There is a lot of process going on. Um, they, they are typically more soluble, <clears throat> and uh, they are process at uh, um, lower, it can be processed at lower temperature. And a common thought is they're much more soft, stretchable and flexible. So what is, are the challenges that we have been facing from the science and the market perspective? Obviously, from the science perspective for developing these type of materials is to how can you improve the performance, enhance the stability, uh, achieve efficient uh, multi-layer integration, which is essential to make devices. All of these devices are made by multiple layers of materials. Fundamentally, how can we solubilize uh, organic macromolecules, which typically requires very strong intermolecular interaction? If the interaction between molecules are very, very strong, the molecules should be less soluble. So this is, seems to be a contradiction. And how can we retain the electronic properties while achieving good mechanical flexibility and stretchability. Uh, from a market's perspective, which is very relevant for Flexterra, he is, it is how can we create uh, uh, new IPs with material, which can then compete with a solid technology based on inorganics to create new markets. So let me start uh, from some example and where I'm trying to gonna mix a little bit of science and, uh, and, and, and some of the technical things we have done at Flexterra looking at a semiconductor for flexible stretchable transistor. So let me start with a, a, a basic uh, introduction about this device, which is a very simple device. This is a great device to test charge transport in, in organic materials. So that's why it's so important. And it's, as well as a key building blocks to make many types of devices. So this is a very simple device. It's a three terminal device where you have source, drain and gate. This is the conductor material. Then you have the yellow, this is the semiconductor, and then you have a gate dielectric. So there you have all the ingredients of the, from the materials perspective from, for electronics. 
And the device works in a way where if you apply a bias between the source and drain, but there is no bias between the source and the gate, in this current voltage plot, you are in the off states because the semiconductor is a very low carrier density. So no, uh, there is no carrier, although there is a bias here, there is no current. So your device is in the off state. By applying a, a gate bias, you induce carrier at the interface between the semiconductor and the dielectric. So you create carrier, you have a bias, you have current. So you go from the off to the on state. So you can switch this device using two independent potentials. And if these carrier are a positive or holes, these are called P-channel semiconductor or P-channel transistors. And if they are electrons, uh, negative charges, these are called N-type semiconductor or N-type transistors. And the key performance parameters in these devices, which quantify the quality, is uh, the field effect mobility, the carrier mobility, mu, okay? And for amorphous silicon, which is a sort of the standard, is the mobility is between 0.5 and 1. So fundamentally, if we want to make devices which are flexible, which are made from uh, material which are solution processable, uh, and, and so far, so on, uh, all the stack, all the materials should be solution processable, flexible, stretchable, and, and so far, so on. And from a, a chemistry perspective, from a, a, a chemical uh, uh, view, you know, polymers and amorphous solids should be the best candidates. For all of what I said, I just want you to remember three important things. One is the carrier are confined in the semiconductor very close to the dielectric. So all interfacial defects and all uh, issue occurring at that interface in terms of topology defect affect this charge transfer very, very much uh, in conjugation with the electronic structure of the semiconductor. So I want you to remember this morphological issue. The second one, uh, uh, P-type semiconductors are well-known, well-developed, However, electron transport is semiconductor are much more rare. So are the one where we did most of our work and I'm gonna show you some of the results. And to make N-type semiconductor, you have to have molecule where the LUMO energy is very, very low or the conduction band in the electronic structure in the solid state are very, very low. You need to push down these energetics. And the and third important thing I want you to remember is that our competitor is amorphous silicon. We don't want to compete in terms of technology. We cannot, as a matter of fact, it's not that we don't want, but right now what we can compete is all products based on amorphous silicon. So mobility between 0.5 and one is our number. So everything about this number, it's good. So what we have done in Northwestern University and Flexterra and with many, many collaborators, um, is uh, uh, you know developing a lot of things around the TFT. There is so much going on and there is so much to study. So we did a lot of chemistry to develop the semiconductor and dielectrics. And I like it here in yellow, in, in red, there are some of the collaborators that I'm very, very grateful. I don't have time to acknowledge all of them, but uh, you know this has been a teamwork. Uh, so we did develop material, we understood uh, and we did study and I tried to understand the charge injection, charge transport at this interface looking at different device architectures. So it's really a work going all along from going, starting from molecular design, synthesis, characterization at the, at the, the molecular level, at the film level, and then going from device fabrication, applied physics and prototyping. And for today, I'm gonna to try to give you two flavor, one about molecular design of the material and one about going from material to a, a product. So if you look at uh, uh, the, from uh, chemistry, so we have done a lot of chemistry and, uh, and here are just example of chemical structure for those of you who are organic chemists or they are very interested in this field. These are example of small molecule or polymer we had developed in Northwestern. These are molecule and polymer which preferentially transport uh, electrons, negative charges, and these are preferentially whole transporter, positive charges. And what you can see from the design there is commonality which are uh, the presence of these aromatic cores, you know, planar units, a lot of catenation, pi conjugation. So these are common feature for both classes of material. And this is what you usually have to do to design these type of molecules and polymers. 
And that is a lot of specificity, uh, which is uh, related if you want to make uh, uh, electron conductor versus hole conductors, where for electron conductor, you usually have molecule functionalized with electron with joint functionality and a lot of electron pore unit. So you see a lot of fluorocarbons, uh, carbonyl, uh, imide, uh, cyano group. These are really units which brings down energetics. And instead, if you want to make whole conductor, it's exactly the opposite. You want to raise the balance band. So here you have electron donating functionality, electron rich, uh, electron rich unit, alkoxy, um, uh, amino, and so far, so on. So this is from the general. I'm going to focus on one particular family of material, which are these electron conductor based on the uh, NDI molecule. Uh, and the I unit. And this is our sort of our favorite polymer. It's a, it's a polymer that we discovered many years ago, um, uh, which uh, have found applicability not only in, in transistor, but also in solar cell and in other, many other type of device architectures. And the way we designed this polymer is really thinking about a very, having a very strong uh, electro withdrawing uh, uh, functionality then conjugated with this dithiophene unit. And this combination really gives LUMO energies, which are very, very low, uh, for which uh, electrons are very, very stable. So we, this is a very good electron conductor. Uh, this functionalization on the nitrogen atom provides solubility, which uh, allows the polymer to be uh, spin-coated, uh, gravure printed. Um, and we did uh, um, devices by gravure or by inject printing. I don't know if this is going to work. Um, probably I need to exit the laser for. Um, uh, I apologize a second. I don't know how to. No, cannot make the. Um, um, that's OK. So I cannot make this uh, video work, but maybe I can do it by this. See if it works. Oh, be here. OK, so if we use the same formulation for gravier printing and we try to inject print it, it doesn't work. OK, so we, uh, we did a lot of in a reformulation. This is an essential aspect of industry on the industrialization to really create uh, um, devices. And then we know this is a very good uh, electron conductor where we have uh, um, very good uh, um, transport and, uh, and electron mobilities, which, which are between 0.2 and, uh, and, and 1. So the question now is uh, um, uh, what we have found and what we, by learning more from this polymer is that is, uh, this is actually not an ideal polymer. It's a great material, but uh, if you look at from the conjugation perspective, this is not the best polymer. And the reason is because of the steric interest between carbonyl and the CH group. Uh, there is a torsion between, uh, about this bond, okay? So the polymer is not very pl planar, but you have a sort of deconjugation. And having this partial uh, not planarity, uh, you know, from the chemistry perspective, tell us this, we, this polymer performance could be improved. So what we did uh, more, more, more recently are a few things. And one of the question is, so we achieve mobility between 0.5 and one by gravure printing, inject printing. Can we get better performance by doing additional process? This is the first question. The second question is if we make these type of polymers planar, are they gonna be performing better? Uh, the third question is, are these polymer really uh, plastic or elastic or, or not? So this, is, this will affect more the intrinsic mechanical properties of the material. So we, we started working on that. And uh, this is a, a work, uh, it's a little old work, but I, it gives you the understanding is that if we use the same polymer and in, instead of spin coating or just inject printing, we uh, bar coat the, the, the film. And bar coat is a technique which apply a shear force, which aligns the polymer chain. Then the polymer chain can be aligned in the direction of charge transport or perpendicular to the source and drain contact. This is perpendicular to the charge transport. And if you align the polymer chain along the charge transport, the mobilities are much larger compared to spin coating. Uh, if you align in perpendicular, it's much lower. So this tells us that uh, what you achieve here is the possibility to get much higher performance. At the same time, you can have anisotropy in charge transport. 
which can be a problem when you make devices and you arrange the TFT in different directions. But this is not so important at this point. We can improve the performance by process. And this is something you really keep in mind. And uh, we can use barcoding. Another way to apply a share force is using brush printing. And here we study not only this polymer, but also um, other polymers, uh, P3HT and uh, an amorphous polymer and a completely amorphous conductor. And in, uh, what I want to point is when you apply a share force, uh, in this uh, view graph, I show basically these are the field effect mobility for the spin coated devices, or this is the conductivity for the spin coated devices. And you apply uh, a share force, the message is you can always find condition where the mobility is much larger or the conductivity is much larger compared to the um, spin coated um, compared to the spin coated um, um, uh, the, the spin coated uh, devices okay also what you see here that in some cases you you see anisotropy and in some cases you don't see any anisotropy and this is because of the different aggregation if you have more interested uh, in this area you can look at it at, at, at this paper so now let's go back a second about chemistry. And what I told you that this polymer is twisted because of the, uh, the torsion uh, occurring, um, occurring here, okay? So one way to make a planar structure would be to eliminate this torsion by eliminating this uh, uh, carbon hydrogen bond. And this is what we have done here by designing this uh, thiazole uh, naphthalene imide polymers where from conformational analysis, this should be able to planarize. So we made this polymer. I don't have time to go into the chemistry. If you're interested, just contact me. And there is, what is the result is uh, shown here, uh, which is uh, interesting, is that uh, the mobility for the starting polymer remains higher compared to the planarized polymer. So th the question is why? And the reason is the morphology. Uh, uh, this new polymer, basically, it is uh, much less soluble. So when you spin coat the film or you deposit the film, they have much less, uh, um, um, much, much more topographical defects. And having much more topographical uh, defect, uh, we, um, uh, we create trap carrier at the interface between the semiconductor and the dielectric. So we, uh, it's not an intrinsic property, but it's because of morphological defects at the interface. So how can we get around this morphological interest in, in morphological defect and probe the intrinsic property of the material? The, the way to do it is not to make devices on a thin film transistor, but make devices using a bulk film. So here there is no any interface. And then if I dope the device, these are conductivity measurement in, the, in bulk, and we compare the conductivity of the uh, planar which is shown here versus the twisted polymer, the conductivity of the planar polymer is much better. So basically the message is, if you can make a planarity, if you improve planarity, you still have processability and you avoid interfacial defect, you can improve performance by planarization. Okay, I showed you an example how to do planarity by re removing this carbon hydrogen bond. Another way to do it would be to remove this carbon oxygen bond, okay? And uh, the way to do it is we can remove both of these carbonyl groups. And here you can create two units, which could be uh, in theory, um, which are, can be derived from this, uh, this starting uh, molecule by removing the two carbonyls. And what we know, uh, I don't have time to go into details, what we know that one of these units, which is this one, is actually much more twisted compared to the starting point. Instead, the other unit, which is where the thiophen is next to the carbonyl, is much more planar. And the planarity has been confirmed. These are crystal structure, okay, the, of the two molecules. So the, what we expect is polymer based on this twisted unit should perform worse than the starting building block, and the, the one which are more planar should perform better. And this is what we actually, uh, we have seen. If we measure the mobility of this type of polymer, this is uh, inactive basically, which is twisted. This other polymer, the mobility is larger compared to the starting NDI polymer. And if we optimize the comonomer by chemistry, 
we can start getting mobility, which are much larger, three, four. Remember, mobility of amorphous silicon between 0.5 and 1. Here we can get three, four. By doing a bar coating, five, six can be achieved. So we can greatly pass the performance of amorphous silicon. So these are all good news, okay? We can compete with amorphous silicon in terms of performance. However, when you try to make a real product, um, you have to compete not only with the material amorphous silicon, but you have to compete with the whole technology and the fabrication process, uh, uh, which is associated to it. And when you go from uh, basically to the material to a final product, which is an example of a flexible display, uh, the process consists of uh, starting from a glass carrier, okay, in which you laminate a plastic substrate. Then typically you deposit a buffer layer, uh, which will reset the chemistry of the substrate or the carrier. And then you put your uh, contacts, which can be the source and drain, the semiconductor, the dielectric, the passivation. And all of this process involve uh, spin coatings, slot die coating, all photolithography to pattern the different areas. Uh, when you see the, old, the first TFT, then in, in reality, you have to make an array. And here you have uh, to make a final display, something between half a million and 30 uh, million TFT. Then on top of this TFT, you need to put your front plane and you have to delaminate. So there is a lot of going on. It's not only per, what I want, the message is, it's not only the performance of the material in a small substrate, but it's all the whole process which has to compete with the, the technology. And uh, to, so you understand the difficulty, you need to deposit set films, organic films, which goes from 15, 30 nanometer, as thin as 15, 30 nanometer for the semiconductor, too thick as two four mi micrometer for what is called the passivation layer on top of the, of the TFT array. And then you have a lot of stress because of cutting at the lamination to cut off your little pieces of displays. And this is not uh, done uh, on, uh, on, a, on a very small area. So these are actually what are called carrier glasses in which the display are fabricated and the larger glasses are actually on the order of uh, three meters times three meters. And our glasses or so our carriers, um, uh, these are actually the minimum production now uh, for some of these display are done on this type of generation. And uh, 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 this is a sort of one of the minimum possible generation on, uh, uh, on, a, um, on a spin coating, uh, spin coating pro uh, line. So this is where we have to call this 15, 30 nanometer. And it is here where the technology has to compete. And then after you deposit all of your material, you have to eliminate, remove your substrate uh, from the carrier. And then you have to cut all the, your little displays and all your circuits can be the circuits for sensor can be circuits for display and so far so on. So it is here where the difficulty of the technology is, it's not in just the performance. I wanted to give you a, a flavor of that. And uh, so most of the literature, TFT literature is done on spin coating on this type of area. There are some demonstration on this type of areas which are 40 uh, by 30, 40 centimeter. And there are only very, very few. I think we are the only one where we actually made the OTFT on a Gen 3.5 line, which are half a meter, more than half a meter times half a meter. And uh, this is the what is called generation 0 0.5, which is the smallest pin coater for R&D, which is about 20 centimeter by 20 centimeter. And this is the smallest uh, spin coater in real production. And you see, this is a person. So these are really big type of equipment. And in, in this, uh, I don't know if I make this video work, but um, uh, here it, you, you, have, you deposit your material, you spin coat, and this is done on this large, large spin coaters. So despite uh, all of these difficulties, we have been able to make uh, flexible displays. Um, let's see if I can do this. Um, flexible display, these are modules which uh, are different form factors. And this include about, uh, from about 700,000 to about 900,000 OTFT, and they have all to work, all of them to make the display work. Okay. Um, now let's move on a little bit and uh, uh, going back a little bit about the fundamental. And what I, I mentioned is that, uh, um, you know, we want to make 
flexible display. Um, so we thought, okay, organic can be great for this technology. So the common thought is that uh, organic semiconductor are soft, uh, which is typically true, but then is also thought uh, there is it is a thought that they are they can be elastic or plastic. Uh, however, this is typically not the case, particularly for the semiconductors and the conductor which are used to fabricate these circuits. Also, what I want you to think about is that the mechanical stress uh, depends strongly on the field of use. So it makes a big difference if you make a, a product and then you bend it and the you bend the circuit only once to keep the film fa form factors, or if you, uh, you, know, you, you flex it multiple times or you stop, start stretching it multiple times. Okay, the deformation are very, very different. And, uh, um, and uh, in this view graph, I just show you some examples so you have sort of uh, basic understanding is um, if uh, these are the chemical structure of, of some uh, semiconducting or conducting polymers um, used uh, for, tra for transistor, or these are small molecules such as pentacene and tips pentacene. And this is the young modulus of them and the elongation at break. So, you know, uh, this give you how soft is the material, which is the el elastic deformation. And this is tell you when the crack starts, when you start, you know, pulling the film apart. And, and you want to have this number as low as possible. And if you compare this number with uh, silicon or the electronic material, uh, these are much lower, but if you compare them to real elastomers, these are much larger, okay? And what the community has been doing with, with beautiful works is to try to reduce this number. The best classes, the classic strategies is to basically throw in elastomers into with your molecule or polymer. And uh, this has been very successful for polymers where you can depress the young modulus and increase the elongation at break, but has been unsuccessful for, for, uh, for small molecule. And, uh, and this is because of phase separation. So there is quite important question that we ask ourselves and we are studying is the first one, can you actually make the, uh, this type of small molecule more elastic? Can we plasticize them? The second is, can we find other way instead of blending to make the polymer, the semiconducting polymers more uh, stretchable? And the third one, uh, can we make inorganic become more bendable or stretchable using organic as a tools? So let me start with the small molecule and the community has been actually doing blending for, you know, for quite uh, some time. And, uh, um, and, and these are a few examples, but if you do blending and then you measure the mechanical properties, they don't really change too much for the pristine molecule or the blend. And this is because the small molecule phase separate from the polymer. So basically uh, what uh, the deformation is the dominate is by the, uh, by the small molecule itself. So this polymer basically simply don't work as a plasticizer. So we wanted to study this, this uh, problem. And to do it, we use uh, this type of, of small molecule. This is an N-type, we like N-type. So we use this molecule. Uh, this molecule by spin coating or drop casting gives polycrystalline films. And if you take this film on elastomers and you start uh, bending them, uh, sorry, this is not on an elastomer, this is on a plastic on PET. Uh, or PN, we did it on both. Um, and you start bending them, you see that uh, when you bend it about a four millimeter, you form cracks, okay? So can we avoid formation of this crack? So we design a binder and the binder we design is shown here is a polymer binder, which has a semiconducting core, which resemble the, the polymer I show you before. And it has two anchoring group. And these two anchoring group should act as a molecular recognition to the small molecule. And our hope was the, the polymer would confine the grain boundaries and make them more elastic. So we, what we did, we studied blend between the small molecule and the polymer uh, with different ratio from no, no polymer additive, 2%, 5%, 10%. And what you see here, uh, if you don't have any binder, you could have crack. If you put about two and a half percent at four millimeter, you still see formation, some crack, but much less. And when you put more than 5%, the polymer, uh, the film becomes uh, uh, really uh, much more elastic and it doesn't form any, any, any crack. Um, 
this polymer is unique um, uh, to this process. And in fact, if you do the same blending with, uh, the, with, with this backbone, without the anchoring group at the end, and you add it about 5%, um, you still see forming crack. The crack are more uh, shallow because the polymer is phase separating on top of the semicon semiconductor, so of the semiconductor small molecule. So you see it less uh, visually, but the cracks remain there. So you really have to have a properly designed semiconducting binder. And uh, what is more compelling is, um, uh, compelling is that if you make devices and you start bending is, uh, if here, if you bend the pristine uh, device without any binder, um, this is a different in bending radius, the mobility decreases. If you put 5%, the degradation of mobility is much less. But what is more important, if you binding multiple times, the, uh, without any binder, the mobility continue to decrease if still, if you have the binder, the mobility stabilizes, okay? At a certain point, after micro crack are formed, then all, most of the grain binders are plasticized. And by using um, a TM and EDEX, we can quantify that most of the sulfur, which is present only in the, uh, on the polymer, uh, is present at the grain boundary. This is an imaging of the um, elemental mapping of the grain boundaries where fluorine is mostly everywhere because it uh, is in the semiconductor and the semiconductor is also a little bit under the grain boundary, but the sulfur is mostly the grain boundary. So these, these data are very compelling. Also what is very compelling, if I made devices by blending this polymer with the small molecule and I do bending, uh, it dies as well after multiple bending. So we can definitely plasticize small molecule semiconductor by this strategy. Um, another thing we wanted to study is, is, are, is this polymer really elastic? And uh, the, the answer, the short answer is actually not very elastic at all. Um, uh, from this video, basically you see fo forming crack uh, somewhere between two and 3% uh, uh, elongation. So uh, not a very good uh, elastomer at all. So the question is how can we make it more elastic. We can do blending with elastomer. This is a strategy we have investigated and it works. Uh, another way to do it is by learning, uh, by comparing chemis chemical structure. Right? If you compare polyacetylene with uh, uh, polyethylene, this is a pi conjugated system. This is deconjugated. Uh, basically these double bonds, this pi conjugation make the polymer chain much more stiff. So what we did is we, took a polymer and we start throwing in a different quantity of this deconjugated unit. And when you put in this deconjugation um, and we made devices uh, and we compare the variation of the mobility with bending, if you use the fully conjugated polymer, so there is only the blue component, uh, the mobility decreases very, very fast. If you only have the deconjugated unit, the mobility is much more, is very, very stabilized. And in the situation where you have a mixing of these two units, you are in between, okay? So basically this is a different strategy to try to enable um, a, a, a depression of the, uh, of, 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 the, um, um, of the young modulus of the system. And so we can go from film, which crack at about one, 2% to film, which crack on the order of 30%. So we can do chemistry. Another way to do it would be to learn from uh, uh, metals, from how people have developed much more stretchable metal. And this is by imprinting a particular morphology of the film. So if you take gold film and you make serpentines instead of to have a, a film and you start stretching it, you know, the conductivity remains quite large because you have this mechanical deformation which absorbs most of the energy. So can we apply this strategy to the organic? And the answer is uh, yes. First of all, we have to learn how to make this structure. And this is a, um, this are, is a basically is a network of a polymer uh, which uh, has cavity in between. And this is created by a breadth uh, a figure method. If you are interested, you can look at this paper. And here we can create porosity to do a number of devices, which I don't have time to talk about. We can make uh, you know, more sensitive transistor. We can make electrochemical transistor, which where the ion can penetrate better. 
we can enhance the dopability and things like that. But also what is much more important, we can create uh, structure which are much more uh, elastic because of, of uh, uh, because of the fact that uh, some of these uh, the, this network can basically can deform much more easily out of plane instead of in plane. This is a work we have we have submitted. Very quickly, I'm going to finish on uh, for the for TFT by more giving a message is obviously we love organic. We're talking about organic electronics and I, you work in organic, you love organic. But there's many in organics which have very competitive advantage in organic semiconductor, which are great materials. Uh, and an example are these metal oxide and the metal oxide are great because they, they are transparent. In the amorphous states, they can have a very high carrier mobility, much higher than in uh, organic typically. And uh, you can process them in solution in ambient, something that cannot be done by on silicon or, or other 3.5 semiconductor. So these are the great advantage. The, the, the problem is if you take many of these metal oxide and you start bending it, they crack, okay? And uh, the question is, can we make uh, oxide which are much more bendable and stretchable? And we wanted to do it using organic. And the way we do it is basically creating a, a blends where polymers, which can be a PVP or PI, can be incorporated to a different extent into the matrix, into the metal oxide matrix. And when you do incorporate the polymer for a, for a content, which is on the order of 1%, 2% compared to the pristine film, uh, they, they become much more elastic. So the crack do not longer form and they, and they continue to behave as a good transistor. So I don't have time to go into the detail, but this is definitely a route to flexible electronics, which I believe can be very, very promising. Another route that uh, we published recently, um, a lot of work done by Bingao, uh, is by using organic as a sort of support to create uh, uh, metal oxide nanostructures, which are much more mechanically flexible. And, and stretchable. And here in this technique, basically you use a, a polymers and metal salts, which are the precursor of the metal oxide. And, it's, and these uh, are spray, spray coated and they form fibers, okay? And these are the fibers that you obtain. These are not metal oxide fiber. This is the polymer organic, which embed the salts. It creates a sort of the structure, the, the backbone of the network. And then, you burn off all the organic at 500 degrees and you get beautiful uh, um, oxide fibers, IGZO, ITO, copper oxide. You reduce copper oxide, you get copper. And this uh, uh, fiber then can be transferred from the rigid substrate to the elastomer. And at and, and this point, they become flexible and quite stretchable. And these are, uh, I don't have time to go into detail, but we did a lot of experimental and computation to understand how uh, 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 the stress uh, is uh, um, evolves for strain for fibers which are uh, oriented in different direction. And the fact that you have a network with fiber oriented in different direction mitigate the overall strain and enables good connectivity between different pieces of fibers, although they break. The result is basically you can get quite a nice uh, um, conductivity resist or variation in resistivity, whatever you want to call it, uh, for different strains, something you cannot obtain uh, if you have a pristine, pure film, a compact film. And having fibers then open you new possibility, not only to make stretchable things or bendable things, but also to use uh, fibers to make sensor. This is IGZO fiber where we made UV temperature, gas, uh, different type of gases sensors. Uh, so IGZO is very good for this. And instead of copper oxide and ITO is much better for pressure sensors or for ITO is much better for strain sensor. I don't know if this video is gonna work. It's not working, but you, so you have to believe me. So here we move the finger and you see variation in the resistivity. Okay, now let me, I, I hope I gave you a sort of very briefly, a few things to think about. You know, there is really a lot that we have done in, in the transistor, in flexible transistor, transistor to circuit, circuit to final 
device for the for the display. Uh, um, uh, we have also been working quite extensively in, a, in other area. As an example, is organic photovoltaics, and what we are very interested in are photovoltaics based on a bulk heterojunction solar cell. Um, it's very intuitive how this device function. Right, you shine light inside and you take out uh, a current. Uh, you know, you, you produce electrical energy, solar energy into uh, electrical energy. And the, the cell we are interested in are uh, with what are called bulk heterojunction, which is a mixture of two semiconductors. One is called donor, the red here, which is the p-type semiconductor in transistor, and one is the acceptor, which is the equivalent of the n-type semiconductor in, in the transistor. And the key figure of merit is in this device is the power conversion efficiency, the PCE, which tells you how efficient is the conversion of the solar energy into solar power into electrical power. And again, we here we've done quite a lot of work in chemistry, mostly in chemistry um, uh, and the interface, less in the, on the device architecture. And again, here, I wanna thank uh, a lot of the PI uh, collaborators uh, that uh, you know, really help in the, in the development of this field. So uh, we have done quite a lot, of, a lot of work, but what we are very interested about uh, this uh, um, bulk heterojunction and I apologize for the um, for the um, 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 uh, speaker. Uh, here we can uh, the advantage of here we, is that we can coat uh, these blends uh, from solution very very efficiently, uh, and the coating can happen um, you know in, in roll to roll fashion. And here is the brown is the basically the bl the blend of the two semiconductor deposit on a plus uh, on ITO contacts on plastic, and then it goes through an oven to do the drying, um, and, and then you cut off the different modules, okay? So uh, this is a, a something we have done at um, uh, in Northwestern, but uh, mostly is a, um, more recently, we have done it with uh, Ray Energy Tech, which is a company which was spun out from a, a Polyera Corporation, which was a company developed in Northwestern. Anyhow, what was important and what we are interested in is to make uh, this type of modules that I show you the process a second ago, but what is very important is this, uh, what is accepted in the field is this, uh, this cell has to be encapsulated very, very well. But what is very important is the process has to be done in ambient. We cannot do the whole, put the whole machine into a nitrogen glove box. So uh, what you have shown here, this is about eight years ago, uh, that we can process the, these blends in under nitrogen and in air and get uh, basically identical performance. What is also very important is this module, these cells can be very, very stable. Here we are more than 50,000 hours. So many, many years uh, with only, we're retaining about 80, uh, eight, 90%, it's more than 80%, about 90% of the efficiency. So this is something that can be done. Uh, the PCE uh, are on the order of 5% for this cell, which are still not close to the, uh, again, the competitor, which are a sort of morpho silicon cells. So how did we get here? We have done um, quite, uh, uh, quite a lot of work in designing polymers. Again, these are uh, donor polymers, so P-type semiconductors. And a, a lot of work we have done is by mixing, creating cell where the the acceptor is a fullerene. And using blend of this time, we demonstrated the power conversion efficiency between 5% to 11% in module on the order of 5%, if you consider the whole process. So what has been very new and exciting in the field of organic uh, photovoltaics has been the transition from fullerene to non-fullerene acceptors. And using these non-fullerene acceptors, the efficiency really starting picking up. Uh, from below roughly 12% now uh, to, uh, you know, on the order of 16% using this uh, non-fullerene access, acceptor, which are called ITIC. So we, we started working on IT, uh, on this type of acceptor a few years back. And one of the things we did it is to take this uh, molecule and understand the effect of the pi extension. And, and you can ex pi extend these N groups uh, linearly or you know bending it a little bit and what we discover is when you this, you do this pi extension you promote intermolecular interaction along these end groups which are which create the network for transporting the carrier the electrons in the acceptor phase and uh, 
we were able to demonstrate quite nice efficiency on the order of 10% compared to about 8% of the standard for these plants combination. This was a sort of our first generation. In our second generation, we started studying the fluorination and uh, of, of this end unit because it is known on, in organic chemistry when you mix uh, fluorocarbon and hydrocarbon, they start packing much more closely. So we made the uh, acceptors where the number of fluorine goes from two to three, four, and six. And we map uh, um, the chemistry and we mess, map all the, we, we were able to get all the crystal structure, uh, understand all the packing. And indeed, when you put more fluorine, the, 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 the lattice start compressing. And when you compress the lattice, you get uh, uh, cells which, uh, you know, study them vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, the performance, uh, performance increase. Basically, more you fluorinate the acceptor, more you increase the performance. In our sort of latest generation, what we did, we combined this uh, unit, which is a dis discovered um, known, uh, known, known unit uh, with our pi extension and, and fluorination. So we combine the two strategies. And we, when we do so, we can obtain cells which uh, you know, start getting efficiency, which are very, very close to the state of the state of the art. So we can use this uh, um, more for fundamental work. In practice, what we are interested in is try to make not only say, but to make modules. And uh, I, you know, a couple of years ago, we have been able by using blends of, of this particular polymer, which is quite easy to synthesize with this Y6 acceptor to make a cell which are not only can be processed and baked in, a, in air with uh, quite large efficiency, but also modules here are, are the order of 20 centimeters square, which very, very large PC. Here we are starting getting close to 10%. And with this module, ray energy, we are studying uh, certain things. Uh, and uh, we are also studying a lot about the mechanics, how we can make modules which are really well uh, bendable and with and if, if they're failing modes, where do they, do they occur? Another big improvement in the film comes moving from small molecule to polymer acceptors. And we really like having a polymer polymer blend instead of to have a polymer small molecule blend because of the greater stabilization in morphology. Um, this is one of the key issues of the stability of the small molecule polymer non-fullerene blends. So we, we are starting, we are working on, on this polymer polymer blends by thinking about three particular issues. One about the effect of the molecular weights. If you have two polymers, you have two molecules, two, you can have multiple molecular weights for the donor and the acceptor. So you don't have only two points, you can have a matrix of, of, of points you need to screen. Uh, the other one we we'll think is about processing. Can we improve the performance by processing for what we learn from the polymer alignment? And the third is to try to understand the mechanics of the old polymer cell compared to the small molecule polymer cells. And again, I don't have time, but we did study, and I want to just, these are just messages. Basically, when you look at a matrix of polymer with different molecular weight, uh, uh, the, the response, the PC depends on whether the two polymers are both polycrystalline or crystalline. And this is the case of this uh, blend. In this particular case, the PC maximizes for medium molecular weight of the both components. So the molecular weights of both components is very, very important. However, if you mix two polymers where one is amorphous, then it is the amorphous component which pin the performance, okay? And the molecular weight of the, of the acceptor this, and the crystalline acceptor has much, much less influence. And this is mostly a result of morphology, not so important. Second question is, can processing improve the performance? And the answer is yes. If you apply a shear force using properly designed uh, tools, in this particular case, if you talk about blade coating, is the design of the blade which uh, shear, which presses the liquid during the deposition of the film. What we discover is if you design blades which uh, creates a fluidodynamic where the two polymers mix and then they are pushed out during the, 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 the deposition, 
uh, uh, you really get much higher performance compared to design of blades which don't have any feature or they have a, a different fluido dynamic. Uh, if you're interested, you can look at this paper which we just published. Let me skip this. The last part is about, uh, you know, chemistry and mechanical properties. So we have been, like other in the community, we have been able to make uh, polymers, acceptor polymer, by again, using this Y6 core. And again, this is our preferred uh, functionalization is to use this pi extension. And when we do so, we make blends uh, of this acceptor polymer with many types of polymers. Now I'm just talking about one of them. Uh, we start getting PC, which are very, very close to the state of the art for all polymer, all polymer solar cell. What, and this is interesting result, but I believe is not the most important. What I believe is very, very important, and I think the community has to study, is how, what is the mechanical response of, of this blend and how the mechanical response changes going from a small molecule to a polymer and from a polymer to a, a polymer blend. And what we have shown here, this is a work in progress, is if you take the small molecule and you put it on elastomer, it cracks immediately. If you take a polymer, the cracks start on the order of 5%. If you use the blend with the same polymer, with another polymer, the cracks start forming about 20%. So this blending is very, very efficient to enhance the ductability of the, of the, of the system, which is very, very good news for, for solar cell. Great. The last uh, five minutes uh, is only is about uh, an area which is somehow very, very different from the previous, previous two, and uh, um, which is, uh, is, is called, it's called organic cells. Um, and what is the, why we starting working in this area? So we did a lot of work in making sensors using uh, um, electronic components. So uh, can be TFT, can be electrochemical system, can be um, uh, fibers using resistive components. Um, and this is a great way to sense. Another way to sense uh, uh, analytes is using SERS, which is a surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, which is basically is a process where you enhance the scattering or Raman line for a molecule which are absorbed on typically on metal surfaces. And the enhancement factor, which is called EF, uh, can be very, very, very large, can be from 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 14, very, very large. And this is due to two contributions, which is called electromagnetic enhancement. This is, a, you need a conductor. So you need a, a material on the surface here, which has a, a lot of electrons, okay? The other uh, contribution to the EF is uh, coming from the chemical, chemical enhancement, where there is a, 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 basically the states, the electronic states of your small molecule, the molecule, the analyte, and the surface mix. And by this mixing, you, you, you alter the electric field near the, you enhance the scattering of the, of the Raman light, okay? This is a, usually a predominant, and then there is this second contribution. And the best material for, for this uh, application are metal, typically silver, copper, gold. Uh, there are some uh, inorganic metal oxide semiconductors, um, and there is some example of polymers. <clears throat> so for organic, we are far behind. So the enhancement factor are only between two and eight, and the best metal are on the order of 10 to the 12, 13, 14, so well below. So can organic compete? So we, we, we we starting working on this and uh, using this molecule, and we love this because it's a um, is a is an N type, and we can prepare film very very fast. And because of this fluorocarbon substituent, uh, this is uh, some SEM images. We can grow very thick film very very fast. And this is the top surface. This is the cross section of the film. You have a lot of sort of this rosette, these uh, mic mic micro crystals on the surface. And when we use, uh, uh, we do a sales measurement using methylene blue as a, as a probe, uh, and we, uh, we start seeing enhancement factor, which are on the order of 1000, which is very, which is quite large for a semiconductor, which is undoped. Um, we can put a little gold on top and enhance it much more, but this is not fundamental and interesting effect because here the organic is only be a, a, a platform for, 
a template for the method. Uh, this platform is very, very reproducible. Um, so it's really something reproducible, real. Um, uh, this cannot come from a, a plasmonic effect because the carrier density in DFH4T is very, very low. So there is no electron flowing around. Um, and it has to come from the uh, chemical enhancement mechanism. So we did a lot of computation to try to understand the mix of the states and which Raman transition can be enhanced. And from this computation, this computation tell us this, this is possible, okay? Let me skip this. Uh, th this is the last view. Of. So what is fundamentally, the question now is that organic chemist and the materials of organic chemist is why DFH, DFH4T is working well. So here we have a pi core. We have these uh, sigma sub substituents, which are fluorinated. And here we get an EF of about 1000. So we design another molecule here. It has the same core but it has hydrocarbon and here the EF is only five. So basically tell us that fluorocarbon is very, very important for this application. Then we made a similar molecule where the pi core again is the same extension and we have here replace uh, uh, this perfluorary uh, perfluoroalkyl with perfluoroarene. And here the EF is also very, very similar. So fluorocarbon and, or, and fluorine are equivalent in terms of promoting EF. Lately, what we did is basically we kept this end unit, but then we did, uh, we, we connected in such a way that the pi conjugated is extended, pi conjugation is extended. And here the EF becomes even larger. Here we are at 10 to the fifth. And here there is really fundamental question are coming out. Here, a chemical enhancement mechanism is going to be very difficult to play a role. The plasmonic effect cannot take place. So why this is happening, we still don't fundamentally know. We know more now. We have we've done more study, and there is work that we are preparing. But fundamentally, there's a lot of interesting questions that come out from here. So with this one, I conclude. Um, um, I show you an uh, example of uh, uh, molecules um, for transistor, making a backbone Polymer backbone planar is very, very important. If the morphology remains good, I can show you that processing is also very, very important. We can enhance performance, create anisotropy under certain conditions. You can make system more elastic by deconjugation, by designing plots proper plastic, plasticizers. And organic can be very, very important to make metal oxide film more stretchable and bendable. For the solar cell, I, I mostly talk about uh, uh, mo molecular and polymeric acceptors. Again, here, a very, very important is to go from the single cell to the module, and uh, Ray Energy is doing a lot of work in trying to implement this material into modules. And finally, I show you an example of a completely different area where organic semiconductors can play an important role. Um, I acknowledge most of the people uh, in the, my niche view graphs. I don't have time to go through the collaborator. These are only very, very few of them. Obviously, all the team in Northwestern. You know, I had I was so blessed to get really great uh, postdoc, visiting scholar, visiting student. Many visiting students became visiting uh, uh, PhD, uh, and then after visiting PhD, remains as postdoctoral fellow, and then as a um, research professors. And, and, and so I'm really blessed of, I cannot possibly talk all about all of them. And again, a, a team of collaborators at uh, Floxterra, Ray Energy, and also in many other institutions. And with this one, I thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. It was an amazing talk. And I was really impressed how much informative and inspiring at the same time your talk can be. And I learned a lot personally too. Thank you so much. So I'm going to share the screen first so that we can have, I'm sorry. So yeah, now we have uh, Professor Antonio Fatsis, uh picture again. So to uh, get the, uh, to have the uh, Q&A sessions and then to have the panel discussion, I'm going to bring, I would like to bring our panelists and ex-challengers to stage. So before that, I would like to introduce them. Sorry. 
So uh, the first uh, the, the first panelist I'd like to introduce is Professor Lai Feng Chi, and she's a professor of Institute of Functional Nano and Soft Materials uh, from Suzhou University. And her key research is, is centered on molecular assembly and on surface reactions. So she's an expert on uh, of organic electronics again, or also as well. And the second panelist is Professor uh, Meng Dai Han from, uh, he's an assistant professor at Peking University in the Department of Biomedical Engineering and College of Future Technology. And um, he's, um, He's working on bioelectronics with 3D architecture, so another expert in organic electronics. And we're going to be, uh, we have, we have, we are having this ex, ex challenger, Mr. Hao Yang Wang. Um, he's from, he's a PhD student at the University of Tokyo, and he's under uh, the supervision of a Professor Takao Someya, and he's now working on flexible wearable devices. So let's welcome uh, these amazing panelists and then or uh, the X challenger and um, also we are going to again welcome Professor Antonio Facetti on, on stage. So we are here. So um, first of all, I'd like to receive, uh, get some questions, uh, not me, but Professor Antonio Facetti would like to get questions from Mr. Hao Yang Wang first as X, X challenger. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So thank you, Professor Antonio. It's a very impressive talk, and especially for the evolution of organic transistors driven by the molecular design. So my first question is, since the organic transistor research, this evolution has been last for more than 30 years. So there's, of course, a certain degree of commercialization as what you are doing now, but there's still a distance from the real large scale industrialization. So compared with the amorphous silicon, what is the most possible advantage of the organic transistors that may help it to achieve real commercial use? Is that price, the performance or something else? That is, an, I mean, it's an excellent and fundamental questions. I mean, I, I guess it's a mixture of, there are several issues, okay? Several several things you need to keep in mind. Um, amorphous silica is a well-established technology has been around for so long. Uh, uh, electronic companies have invested uh, in fab lines for several years, their fab line running. Um, uh, the, the, each fab line runs between one and $3 billion to build. So before they want to switch uh, also partial, partially uh, from uh, one production to a different production, they really have to um, be convinced uh, not only of the validity of the technology, but also what is the impact on their current productions. Um, I, and, 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 and so this is something is, is, is extremely important. Um, what I found is that... Uh, what I can say is uh, organic transistors are real, are, are not real, not only in terms of uh, performance that they can beat, not uh, match, beat amorphous silicon. This is a, a, matter, is a reality. I'm absolutely uh, convinced on that. Um, I mean, I'm, I have evidence of that. Um, so that is a real technology, is a real, is, is a real technological achievement. Uh, what is the issue is more on the production side. And uh, again, uh, before a, a new technology is put into an, 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 and wants to replace an older technology, there is an issue not only from the market side, but how this Faber ran, how um, an equipment does not want to run only for one type of product. Usually you want to mix. And uh, so, for example, there is a Fab line. We work with them. They say, OK, we want to make organic transistor on this line, but only for 20 percent of the time. The other 80 percent, we want to keep running amorphous silicon. But you have to think about that. Uh, there could be contamination issue between the two process. There could be. Uh, different uh, sharing equipment. And uh, uh, this is what is the real challenge of the technology. Try to in, in embed uh, a completely new process into an old process that is still currently doing its job. To answer more direct the question instead in terms of product, um, what amorphous silicon cannot do that uh, uh, um, 
uh, organic TFT can do. One, the thing that for sure amorphous silicon cannot do is sustain mechanical impact. Okay, uh, if you take amorphous silicon backplanes, okay, see if I can show this. So you can make uh, you can make amorphous silicon on this. This is very easy, and actually you can make amorphous silicon backplane and circuits and do and do this. They are still working quite well. But if you take amorphous silicon backplane and you this, they will die. Okay, so. So if you are looking at uh, devices where you want to simply bend a little bit, uh, amorphous silicon and to a certain extent also polysilicon can still be a technology of interest. Instead, if you want to make something where you have impact resistance or, or really true bendability or stretchability to a certain extent, uh, their amorphous silicon and other circuits will will have serious issue. So, uh, so the, the major impact, the major drawback in the technology is not performance, is mostly related on the process, really going from the performance of the single TFT to really implement it into a final product and have a facility dedicated to that. But the, we made these circuits, and I mean, this is done on a fab, and we, we are very convinced they are gonna, you know, they, they, they will come out. Thank you. Yeah, my research is also about uh, flexible wearable devices. So I have the, also the deep feeling about how the mechanic durability is a flexible, the flexibility it is. So I really look forward to the perspective of the organic transistors. So uh, the second question is, you are the co-founder and the CTO of Flexdora. And if you look back, what kind of chance led you to feel that the flexible semiconductors can be commercialized? And what are the key stages and the events for the company's development? And especially, are there any regrets? And now, do you have any message for the young entrepreneurs? Yeah, that is a very good question. I think the most... I, I would answer in reverse because I think it's uh, very, very important. So if, if I would go back 20 years ago, I mean, when I started working on OTFT and the, comp the first company was Polyera Corporation, which was started in 2005. Polyera was doing many different technology, uh, OPV, uh, oxide, uh, uh, organic transistor, and then it was split and the OTFT went into Flexterra in 2016. But one of the uh, one of the things, uh, a young entrepreneur, or uh, one of the regrets is really um, try, to, uh, 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 try to understand more, not the, uh, the technology from the challenge in terms of performance, but try them to see from the challenge from the market perspective. So uh, the driving should not be, hey, I want to make something which has a certain characteristics, but try to say, hey, this is what the market would do if I can get this. And in order to do this, I need a, a certain infrastructure in industry uh, to, to, to achieve it. So to be very simple is, okay, I wanna make a really a, a me mechanically unbreakable uh, display. How, how, who is gonna make it this? Okay, this is made on conventional fab lines. Or oh, how, how does this, fab how do these fab line work? What is the process? What are the equipment? Uh, uh, so if you look at in reverse, uh, you save a, a huge amount of time because we spent a lot of time to making organic semiconductor with mobility of 0.1 and, 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 and then we will give it and then we get a feedback and say, oh no, okay, you, give, you said the mobility is 0.1, but we get 10 to the minus two. Okay, so let's try a semiconductor where the mobility is one. So we make, a, we make a semiconductor, which is the mobility is one. We give it to a company. They said, oh, it's good. The mobility is about 0.4 in our fab. And then we send something, and mobility is two, comes back. OK, the mobility is about 0.7. We are almost there, mobility. <laughs> then we send it again, mobility of three. We are back, mobility is one. Great. So, but then you discover that in order to get the mobility in that industry, uh, uh, you know, they use a process that is not compatible with their fab line, okay? Or they say, uh, in order to, to get this mobility, 
uh, you use a dielectric and this dielectric is cure a wavelength of uh, 550, but the Fab line only uses I line, which is uh, 300 nanometer. And you say, well, why don't you change the wavelength? Why do I have to change the semiconductor? And uh, a Fab line will not change the wavelength how to cure the semiconductor. The a Fab line will not change uh, the solvent is using to, to clean your substrate. A Fab line will not uh, change uh, the timer on which the oven is heated. And uh, for, for example, your semiconductor has to be heated at uh, 120 degrees for, I don't know, 10 minutes, but the oven is set at uh, 120 degrees for half an hour, they will not change it. So, uh, it's, so you really need to know more what's going on there. And my regret is having spent too much time as a technologist, not as a scientist, having spent much more time to try to look at what we can do to improve the performance from our side instead of to fully understand what are the needs and more importantly, the limitations on the customer and production side. So I don't know if I answered most of your question. Maybe I forgot some of them. It, please ask again if I forgot something. <laughs> really a very impressive answer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And, but, sorry. Going, going sorry, so, and so at the current stage, so do you have any message to the young entrepreneurs? My current stage, I mean, it, I, I mean, I, I'm, to be honest, I mean, I, I know my field quite well, so I cannot uh, speak for a biotechnologist entrepreneur, but uh, uh, maybe if you are an entrepreneur, I, I said it's important what I just said. Another important thing is to, um, don't uh, get blind by investments. You know, you sometimes you talk to people that are interested in your technology and they are interested to give you, I don't know, half a million dollars. They say, oh, this seems so exciting. And, and then sometimes you realize, okay, there is this other investor, they want to give me only 250,000 and maybe it's a better suitable to you. So don't get blinded by the, the money you can get from someone to develop your technology, but try to fully understand what is the final mission of their investment, because different investments, investors have different scope, which can be very, very short term, can be long term, which can be purely financial, it can be instead of industrial. So um, you really have to be careful of that. And here I cannot, I cannot give the best advice. You need to have a good. Uh, a CTO or a good business people coupled with a scientist or technologist. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for sharing your all these uh, precious uh, the uh, experience. I yes. So it's uh, let's just be careful uh, for not being blind by the money. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, I'd like to move on to Professor uh, Mongdi Han now. So uh, be, be, before that, I'd like to make small announcements. So on behalf of Professor Life and Chi, so we are going to we are having here Bing Hao Wang. So he's going to ask some questions or make some comments. So so Professor Meng Li Han, if you have any questions for yes. Professor Antonio, or or if you have any, if you want to have uh, make some comments, just feel free to. Yeah, I have a few questions. Uh, so first, a uh, very nice talk, Professor uh, Facetti. So I, uh, I'm working on flexible electronics, but mainly using inorganic material, not organic material. Like you already mentioned in your talk, like you, you use single crystal silicon designed to be in a serpentine shape, but they can be stretchable. And you make the single crystal silicon very thin, then it can be also can also be flexible. So that's my approach in building flexible electronics. So in, all, in your opinion, what are the advantages and disadvantages of organic electronics uh, in the applications of sensing and energy devices or display compared with those using inorganic materials yeah i mean uh, i mean definitely it's uh, it's it's a i would say i mean in i mean i work with inorganic as well and uh, you know i'm not biased to organic i be i believe that a bit diff you know the different technology can go in parallel uh, i would say if you are aiming more at circuits or 
devices which are more robust, more reliable in terms of performance, uh, which can have a broad applicability uh, in which the production uh, can be more um, established in terms of materials. Uh, then inorganic are are great, and uh, you know it's and and you know again you, if you make something as thin as possible, you can stretch any anything at the end. You can get diamonds. Uh, so uh, if you look at the, so if you look at that aspect, if instead if you look at the, another aspect where you want uh, mechanic, you know stretchability, flexibility combined with uh, uh, a process which is uh, done at uh, typically. Uh, um, uh, by additive manufacturing, uh, by uh, on typically a lower temperature, uh, which can be um, more easily exchangeable in terms of design by printing, then organic can be uh, can be quite interesting. Uh, I would say, in the broader view of not or uh, you know flexible or stretchable electronics, but uh, on. Uh, uh, Printable electronics definitely, I think, organic have uh, have, have, have advantages have, have advantages that inorganics don't have, and particularly silicon uh, that does not have. Um, so, uh, my opinion is, if you are looking at performance, obviously inorganics, you should go there. If you are looking more uh, less in performance but more in process and uh, compatibility with uh, solution type of additive manufacturing, then it is where organic uh, can have more advantages. I, I see, I see. Although I didn't work on organic material, but I also noticed that uh, the performance of organic material is getting higher and higher. For example, like the mobility of an organic semiconductor is getting higher and higher. So another quick question is that is, is it possible theoretically yeah. to, to design or synthesize an organic semiconductor that has a mobility higher uh, than the mobility of single crystal silicon? Is that possible? Well, if you consider graphene and organic, uh, you know, one can argue, you know, carbon nanotubes, carbon carbonaceous material. One can argue. I don't. I don't see it in that way. Uh, I don't. I don't see. You know. Uh, I. I. I don't want to say consider those uh, organic in the sense I. I consider them. So if you are talking about more classical organic molecules, um, the answer is uh, you know mobility is you know mobility in poly in the polycrystalline regime definitely has been measured. Uh, we measure mo mobility more than 10, uh, that is possible. Uh, on single crystal, uh, we, we can also achieve mobility on the order between 20 and 30 in thin, thin transistors. Also, uh, other people, uh, you know, um, other groups uh, have, have, mo have shown mobility more than 50, 60. Um, if you do mobility not on, on, on TFT, but you, if you use other, you know, um, Kind of, you know, through uh, time of fly or other measurements, organic single crystal can get mobility more than 100 that have been measured in anthracene. So uh, I think theoretically the answer is it is possible. I, I don't see uh, a, 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 an electronic structure limitation from that point of view. Um, I, I like it to correlate it to what, uh, you know, those performance can do for, for me. I see. So maybe it's not necessary to make the mobility as high as 1,000, right? For for many applications. Exactly. I think what I uh, you you and other people using inorganics, uh, you know, that could be the route where you really want to have those type of mobilities. Uh, I think organic again can be more competitive on the where you have impact resistance, uh, where you want to think about additive manufacturing processes. Uh, where you want to have a truly intrinsic uh, 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 elasticity um, and not just simply plasticity. Uh, there it is certain organic can really be advantageous compared to inorganics. I see, I see, thank you. Okay, thank you to both Mongdi and Antonio. So um, Binghao, you're up next. 
So if you have any question or comment. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I have lots of questions actually. And uh, Antonio, this is a very, very fantastic talk. And, uh, and I cannot wait to see the product to, to be commercialized soon. That I think it should be very cool. So uh, my question is, what's about your feeling about the future direction of organic electronics? Uh, I, I know, we know that the organic uh, uh, LED is commercialized now. Well, what's the next devices can be uh, commercialized for larger scale production? Yeah, I mean, I think organic product based on organic transistors, will, I'm very convinced will come out. Uh, we are working on different uh, display based. Um, I cannot discuss the details, but the one I show are electrophoretic. Definitely electrophoretic can be a platform for organic transistors. Um, now there is also color electrophoretic front plane. So that is an opportunity for OTFT. Uh, I think what it could be the most interesting for organic transistors could be printed circuits. So if you can achieve printability uh, there, it is where I believe uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, other applications of OTFT could really broaden. Uh, right now, to make organic transistor, you have to use uh, amorphous silicon line, okay? But uh, we know we can achieve a very, very similar performance by printing. Uh, however, there is no a printing uh, uh, production line for electronics, for transistors in the world. So there is none. Uh, uh, and, uh, 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 and you might answer, my, my ask why why this is not the case i mean if otft are real why that nobody's doing the printing and the reason is because uh, um i think the oled lesson was is very very useful because people invested a lot of money in, in oled at the beginning a lot of research and then for about 10 years everything disappeared you you know almost no papers in oled uh, everything sort of disappeared and then suddenly the technology came out so I do believe that it is uh, what's happening with uh, organic transistors. Uh, uh, so a lot of work has been done. Now is a sort of an, uh, less uh, interested in, interesting in the terms of per se, for OTFT per se. Uh, and, but for the production point of view is uh, now that the company are, are really understanding that this is a real technology. These are real functioning, stable, Product producible devices, then uh, like for OLEDs, they starting creating the infrastructure to vapor deposit all the different emissive layer, electron injection layer, hole injection layer. This was not present in the my, in, in industry before. So they starting doing that and the, the, the technology and the product move on. So the same thing here. So I think the big advent, we can do OTFT by photolithography, but the problem remains the cost because you sustain the same cost of amorphous silicon because you keep the same infrastructure and the advantage can be to a certain extent. But if you can do printing, then the cost can be extremely much, much lower. And now I think that the industry is convinced this is a real stable, processable, mature platform. I believe that the infrastructure will come. Okay, yeah. So is there any opportunity left for me? Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you know, uh, OTFT still have a huge issue on the, on the stretchability. I mean, uh, you know, I show you results on stretching, but uh, bending, but here we are talking about strain or only few percent. Uh, if you really want something that is really conformable to the skin, something which you want to uh, attach to, to, uh, I mean, uh, uh, to, uh, I mean, I saw a demonstration where they put a circuit next to a, a cooking pot uh, to understand, uh, you know, the liquid level with the temperature. And then when the liquid level passes a certain amount, uh, uh, the, 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 the containers start shaking because it, the food becomes much better. So, uh, uh, and so instead of shaking, you want something stretching. So there is really a lot that, uh, you know, can, can be done. Um, and the, not only for the semiconductor, but the whole stack. Yeah, yeah, I know you are a good cooker. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I saw that. <laughs>
Okay, so do you have any more questions, Binghao, or would it be okay? Yeah, I think it's your turn, probably. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I actually have one question from one of our audience, but that, it seems that the question is very synchronized with Binghao's question, but I would like to re read, it, read it out here. Professor Antonio, this is Jack Xu from company. Congratulations for your wonderful talk. Could you please comment on the organic electronics future and which will be the, its killer application? So yeah, I guess yeah. it's the same one, but- It's a very have... similar question. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think uh, maybe killer application, it's a, a little difficult. I mean, I have some thoughts, but I think it's a key, killer process to enable application is really printing. We really have to do this by printing. Uh, if we really want to broaden and really compete with inorganics, because inorganics can, can be great. So uh, it's, uh, it is what it is. It's, it's great. But uh, again, if you want to have impact resistance in, on top of flexibility, I think organic can have unique uh, um, property. And if you want to process, but if you really want to lower the cost, you have to go printing. Okay, thank you. Oh, we just have a good news here. So Professor Chi is ready now. So uh, she wants to make a comment briefly as a last panelist. Uh, Professor Chi? Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Very sorry. Good. <laughs> I'm, I'm very sorry to have this connection problem. Um, no, no problem. Yeah. You, 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 can, you can hear me and see me? <laughs> yeah, uh, we can hear you very clearly. But... Okay, okay. If you can hear me, it's okay. Um, yeah. So, Antonia, it's very nice to see you here. Um, and um, so you mentioned that uh, um, I, I, I missed a part of your talk, but I, for, fortunately, I, I catch the last part. So um, my uh, 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 question is: You mentioned about uh, the 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 uh, real application and the industrialization of this um, the organic uh, uh, electronics. So uh, I I I would like to ask uh, how much is the industrial input to this uh, field? that we feel that is a, 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 a have a real potential application. So you you are you are in the very front of this area. So you may ask uh, answer this question. Yeah. Now this is a very very important question, and uh, it is uh, actually I'm I could say that we have been working with customers uh, now that they are very very open to tell us what they need, and this is really making a huge difference in how we spend resources. Um, you know, we are obviously, we are a small company, but this, it doesn't really matter if you're a small or large company. Also, if you are a large company, you have a small, relatively at the end, there is division, there's groups. At the end, the resources are always limited. And uh, so we do have uh, uh, very, very good inputs about uh, uh, not only and maybe this is also we learn it. We try to get inputs not only from the uh, R&D team, but mm -hmm. really try to connect the R&D team with the uh, business team and the production teams in this company. And uh, really try to understand what uh, we have to do in order to, we have to satisfy the R&D team because this is the must. But then really to try to have the resources to go towards to satisfying the production and uh, and the and the and the and, and the business team, so uh, unfortunately I cannot dis I cannot tell what company they are, but mm -hmm. uh, we um, we are working with company which are interested in the display technologies, uh, um, and we are working with company which are interested instead in, in uh, uh, bio uh, medical applications. These are the two type of companies that we have been working. And uh, for both of them, uh, again, we have very, very clear in mind uh, what are the spec for our OTFT, what are the steps, uh, the, uh, the spec uh, for our circuits, what are the uh, type of processing that they can do internally, the, 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 what we cannot do. Uh, so, uh, and uh, we have also, which I believe is very, very important, is a forecast of if we are successful, uh, 
what what can what is the forecast in terms of uh, uh, sale for their product so we have a good understanding what we have to do on the supply chain and whether it's something we can do uh, i give you an example you know we can make an organic semiconductor which can have you know we did we made a polymer where the mobility was very very close to 10 but uh, you know the synthesis are you know 50 steps uh, you know if the production you know if the product needs uh, you know few micrograms of this polymer to make mm -hmm. x product you know it's something we know we can afford and we invest time to do it otherwise it doesn't simply make sense so um, your question is so fundamental with the way we have to operate and having the customer feedback it's really what we have to do and what we believe we have at this point and it's, it's a regret going back to yao yang's question is a sort of the regret not having this type of interactions at the beginning thank you I, thank I you I think, think the future is beyond to organic electronics. And <laughs> beyond, beyond to I think uh, I think there is enough there is enough market for everything. You know, yeah. you just... if you have any problem with uh, investigators, so you may contact uh, Chinese people. So <laughs> <laughs> that's that's right. There is definitely you know there is definitely hands there. Yeah, <laughs> and brain. Good. Good. That's good. So after listening to all uh, what you all commented, uh, I wasn't, I, I'm not a person for organic electrons yet, but I feel like I have to jump in to the field. So I'm so convinced. <laughs> Thank you so much for your participation, you. everyone. So uh, since time is up, so I'd like to wrap up our panel discussion at this point. And I'm, I'm very thanking you uh, for your great support here. Thank you so much. So we would like to deliver our certificate uh, to Professor Antonio Pacchetti uh, for his amazing talk and his passionate this, all these comments on the uh, the inspiration on this uh, on on the uh, or, it, organic electronics. I almost said inorganic. Sorry. So, so this is your certificate, and you're gonna get your uh, electronic certificate oh. by email after this. Thank you so much on behalf of every or the committee members here and on behalf of the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you have okay. any questions, just email me. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. So I would like to uh, make some announcements for next week. So next week is uh, one of the uh, like meeting for uh, IPNX events. Uh, next week again, we are gonna have one. So you might notice that we are gonna have our ever first ever Indian speaker from India. So. Uh, so this is, this is one of the uh, historical moments in I, I connect. So you might notice that there's a time zone indicated in New Delhi. So don't miss out from India. So I'd like to see so many, so much audience from India and from all over the world again. So see you next week uh, to explore the 2D materials again. So uh, that will be it for today. So um, let, I'd like to wrap up at this point and thank you so much, everyone. Bye bye.